This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 989, recorded on March 3rd, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, I guess a quick weather report. It's uh, overcast and uh, threatening to rain. Yesterday it snowed. Um, it's cold. And uh, guess what? It's winter. But we're not used to winter. So when it comes, we're taken back absolutely. Uh, but uh, at any rate. That's the weather from here. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's one degree Celsius and 36 Fahrenheit, I think it said. What was it? Yeah, 36 Fahrenheit. But this is the app that says it's raining, but really it's really? snowing. It's and it's snowing? supposed to be raining and snowing and 6 to 12 inches of total oh, wintry mix goodness. by 4 a.m. And Yeah. Mm-mm. Not... Nice. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Great to be here. Uh, It's 44 uh, Fahrenheit, gray, cloudy. (laughs) You sound so sad. (laughs) It's a mad day. (laughs) It is. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. We have 72 degrees and sunny. I knew you'd say that. Really nice. It's uh, (laughs) uh, it's, uh, the red buds are blooming. The leaves, oh, yeah. uh, the trees are starting to uh, leaf out. It's uh, essentially springtime here. I don't anticipate any more freezes, though we're not uh, insured of that. We did have a cold front come through last night, a really sharp one with um, uh, an impressive thunderstorm. We could use some more rain. A couple of announcements before we jump into the science. Kathy, you want to tell us about ASV? Sure. Registration is open. I think early bird registration ends in early May. So you want to get it done before then so that you can get the good rates. And if you're not a member, you can probably get a better rate on registration if you join ASV. Meeting is in Athens, Georgia, June 24th to 28th at a beautiful conference center called the Classic Center. It's immediately adjacent to downtown Athens. And there's a really great program. You can check it all out at asv.org slash asv2023. And members can sign up or register for uh, uh, or apply for uh, awards for dependent care and or, uh, no, not and or, or if they want to bring their kids to the meeting, they can uh, sign up for uh, child care there at the meeting with a third party company called Kitty Corp. So you can either do the application for a, a child care or dependent care grant, or you can come and get the subsidized child care. TWIV 1000 is coming up in April on the 15th. It's a Saturday night. It's going to be at a theater here in New York City. If you would like to attend, we have some seats left with your name on it. On them, you have to send an email to me, Vincent at microbe.tv, and... Uh, as long as we have seats, I will send you a confirmation. So, Vincent at microbe.tv. Uh, Rich, tell us about Paul Berg. Right. We have uh, uh, an unfortunate obituary here. Paul Berg, uh, who died last week at the age of 96. Wow. Um, Paul Berg was uh, a biochemist uh, who... Uh, was a pioneer in recombinant DNA technology and won a Nobel Prize for being uh, one of the uh, first people to uh, clone genes. And um, uh, he was also uh, instrumental in in those early days of recombinant DNA technology. He recognized the uh, theoretical potential, at least, for uh, harm coming from recombinant DNA technology, that is cloned genes getting out to where they shouldn't be, and that uh, he was uh, uh, the one of the primary instigators of the Asilomar Conference, which was a voluntary uh, 
uh, measure by a bunch of uh, scientists to get together and discuss the uh, potential for good and harm from recombinant DNA technology and come up with a set of uh, guidelines. It uh, ultimately proves that it is all good and not any harm, uh, at least uh, that they anticipated that I can detect. Uh, he was known as a particularly humble individual who would never tout his Nobel Prize or any of his other honors, but just uh, do his biochemistry. I found in this, uh, this and other obituaries, one of the things I found interesting was that um, he was recruited uh, early in his career as an assistant professor to Washington University by uh, Arthur Kornberg. And uh, Arthur Kornberg was subsequently approached by Stanford University that was uh, starting a new biochemistry department, asking Arthur if he would um, start up this department. And Arthur said, uh, yeah, if I can bring my whole department with me. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, okay. And that included uh, Paul Berg. And that was the beginning of uh, uh, biochemistry at Stanford University, which is a world-class uh, department, of course. Uh, I was um, just... Uh, uh, I met uh, Dr. Berg on uh, a couple of occasions, uh, and he did some stuff for me quite generously, uh, and so I appreciate him as a man of uh, significant accomplishments and uh, a real human being. So uh, we, I guess, celebrate his passing in a way, because celebrate his life. Hey, 96 years, not bad. 96 years, not yeah. bad. Good guy. I'd like to, like to reach 96. <laughs> Me too. He, he is from Brooklyn. Cool. Uh -huh. Went to high school in Coney Island. How cool. <laughs> I remember he had an accent. Right. <clears throat> Paul Berg. All right, so we have had many emails to talk about the Department of Energy report, quote, because nobody has this report. There's just news about it, so I'm going to wait, and hopefully we get something. I emailed Eddie Holmes and Bob Gary, and they said, we don't know anything. We don't know what they have. Uh, I think it's important uh, news just to know that you uh, contacted a bunch of people and nobody knows anything. OK, yeah. uh, because I certainly don't know anything. And I've been wondering if anybody knows anything and nobody knows anything, which is yeah, there's no, no report. I'm confused about the, it being the Department of Energy and trying to imagine sort of <laughs> what information that energy has. Uh, I had uh, some uh, I had yeah. some correspondence with a, um, a friend of mine uh, who has some insight into national laboratories uh, uh, and et cetera. And uh, he, uh, he points out the Department of Energy has significant sequencing expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, this follows on the uh, World War II when, you know, all these national, la these national labs have to reinvent themselves from time to time as uh, their uh, current mission expires. So mm -hmm. after World War II, the national labs involved in the atomic bomb uh, project uh, needed to reinvent themselves uh, in some fashion or another, and some of them reinvented themselves as um, uh, genomics laboratories uh, with the rationale of uh, uh, trying to understand the effects of uh, atomic energy on uh, genomes, and uh, et cetera. And this involves, in the Department of Energy, significant sequencing expertise, which I would assume uh, then uh, it involves a significant sequence analysis um, uh, expertise, and I will say no more. We, because <laughs> I don't know anything. That's really anymore. that's I, that's really interesting and helpful. Yeah. Well, so. I don't think there's any phylogenetic tree in this report. No. No. I don't think there's any sequence. <laughs> I think it's just what they think <laughs> happened <Right. laughs> or will, might have happened. We will hopefully so, <clears throat> find out. It's interesting that I was uh, consulting for Los Alamos Labs uh, when the DOD uh, changed its name to the DOE. Hmm. The, the, the week I was there, they actually changed their name because um, the DOD has a fairly bad reputation, as you know. The DOE has a wonderful reputation, so they were just going to, you know, atomic energy for peaceful uses, and that's the way they were going to proceed. And that was a while back, and I'm not sure that... Uh, 
I don't know what you're saying, Dixon. There's still a DOD. Yeah. Well, the DOD as we know it is is different than the DOD that was there before that. So the, a lot of that... labs in in in, uh, in the uh, Los Alamos area were working for the DOD, and suddenly they found themselves working for the DOE. Okay, so they they were changed to be under a different agency. That not, is correct. Not that, that is... the. That's right. That's Not right. that the DOD became the DOE. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. No, that's right. But uh, they they did a lot of, uh, it was like musical chairs almost. And uh, everybody was confused as to why that actually happened. But I think it was probably a international reputational uh, move on the part of the DOD. Mm. <clears throat> because, so, you know. Um, right, go ahead. Uh, I talked to a couple of reporters this week and I said, you know, we have a lot of evidence that this is a zoonosis. You know, I don't see any evidence that it came from just speculation. Even the FBI was was moderate confidence they had, I think, not low confidence or something like that. But I don't see any data. So until I see data, it's a zoonosis. So we'll we'll talk about it when um uh, when we get some information, but I have low confidence that there's anything to this report. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to talk about papers. That's uh, well, we have data. The papers are published. We have data, and our snippet today actually was requested by quite a few people uh, before the DOE thing. But uh, I think we can do that because we have the paper. And for example, Natalie wrote. I enjoy listening to Twiv, although I must admit I haven't had time to listen as much lately as I used to. So I don't think you should write that, folks. It really it really upsets me. Don't write it. If that's the fact, just keep it to yourself, okay? Make me feel happy and all of us. My husband sent me this research study because he is increasingly becoming concerned about the COVID vaccines. I'm not entirely sure how to interpret it, as this is not my area of expertise, this UK-based John Campbell, who's a nurse educator and has a PhD in education, I believe, has a YouTube channel where he looks at studies on SARS and the vaccines, and he believes we've all been lied to and manipulated and that the vaccines are more dangerous than the virus. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So, uh, Natalie, the vaccines are not more dangerous than the virus by far, by far. But John Campbell makes a lot of money by saying things like that. He has way more subscribers than we do. <laughs> On YouTube. Oh, my gosh. But uh, he did talk about this study and really uh, misrepresented it. So here we go. It is a short communication in the Journal of Pathology, Microbiology, and Immunology. Uh, and it is called SARS-CoV-2 Spike mRNA Vaccine Sequences Circulate in Blood Up to 28 Days After COVID-19 Vaccination. This is from a group of people at Copenhagen University Hospital and the University of Copenhagen. This is one of these convenience studies where uh, this laboratory is monitoring patients who have hepatitis C virus. And, well, they happen. They, they, what they do is they take blood and they extract RNA and they do uh, high-throughput sequencing or deep sequencing, whatever you want to call it, next generation sequencing, and to see uh, what's going on with their hepatitis C. Uh, and they f unexpectedly found some SARS-CoV-2 vaccine mRNA sequences, and that's what the paper is about. So we have <clears throat> 108 hepatitis C virus patients, five negative controls, and five uh, hep C virus grown in cell culture, right? The positive control. And so they are, these, these, these samples, these bloods are um, being sampled to look for hepatitis C virus. And what they do is they, you sequence the RNA and you read it many times and you assemble the reads into longer, what are called contigs. And then they look to see what these contigs match. And most of the time they match hepatitis C virus or other cellular RNAs, I guess. And then um, in this study, they found some that matched coronaviruses. Uh, and eventually they realized that these were coming from the mRNA vaccines. Because the mRNA vaccines 
remember it's the spike mRNA sequence, they have some modified bases that are unique and uh, so they could tell it was the mRNA vaccine. So they- I liked and- how they described <laughs> that, that they were looking at a sequence that was part related to the vaccine and not the virus. And I thought that that part made me happy to read. Yeah, so it's they can tell it's not a virus infection. It's not SARS-CoV-2 infection because the, the mRNA sequence is, is unique. So they all in all, they have eight, Samp- uh, 10 samples, which have uh, reads that match the uh, mRNA vaccines. And uh, so so here's the problem, the first problem. So 10 of 108, that's 9.3%. So Campbell says 9.3% of everybody in the world who got uh, these mRNA vaccines have mRNA for 28 days. Okay, and that is just not concludable from from these numbers at all. First of all, they're Hep C patients, and I don't know about you guys, but I didn't see any non Hep C or their controls have any uh, mRNA sequences from from the vaccine, right? Uh, I couldn't. Uh, I I saw your question <clears throat> in the notes, and uh, the definition of what they're calling negative controls to me is ambiguous. Um, uh, I yeah. don't know if that's yeah. people who didn't have Hep C or people who've never been vaccinated. So I couldn't quite make that out, and I can't. Yeah. I can't decide from the paper whether the this is a Hep C specific phenomenon. One, so w- one thing that bothered me early on, like right after I read the abstract, was like, okay, this is an interesting claim, kind of a one of those, um, how you know. Uh, remarkable claim. So it should have some really strong data. So I expected them to say, we ran these positive samples multiple times and every single time they came up positive or mm-hmm. or something showing us the reproducibility and the rigor of it. And there was nothing like yes, that. That's correct. Mm-hmm. That's correct. And, yeah. you know, presumably they could get maybe even sequential samples and were they you know from the same individual were they positive and then yeah, negative yeah. or negative and then positive nothing it was very no this is just they got these hcv patient samples and they found this and that was it they didn't do anything else right yeah That's- my my big question was these are all chronic hcv patients and so are these patients somehow immunocompromised yeah. or do they have something unique going on uh, making this happen. They mentioned somewhere, uh, I think it was in the discussion, they'd basically just say, oh, yeah, they're all fine. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that's about how much they tell us to try to say they're not immune compromised and this is the representative of of non-HCV patients, but it's it's yeah. really kind of a throwaway sentence like that. And so um, even without some of these other uh, points that uh, Kathy is making that are 100% spot on, um, this is in chronic HCV patients. Yes, and we have to take that as a caveat as well. Now, remember, they were not the patients were not selected because they got mRNA vaccines. They're selected because they had Hep C, and so not all of them had been vaccinated. They say here that eighty percent of the population in Denmark got two doses of vaccine. They're using Pfizer and Moderna predominantly in Denmark, so eighty percent. The population, so you expect twenty percent of these people that to, to not have been vaccinated, maybe. So uh, that's another thing. You 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 can't make a nine percent if not everyone had been vaccinated. <laughs> um, but what did they get? They got so there's one figure here. So when you do sequencing, of these this kind of deep sequencing, you just keep sequencing. Uh, you, you have RNA and you you make DNA out of it. You amplify it and then you sequence it over and over again. And you can get different depths of coverage. Like a particular sequence, you may have 30 reads or 100. It depends on the abundance of that sequence in the sample, for example. So typically a lot of reads suggest that there are a lot of those sequences uh, in the samples. And then you can assemble short sequences. So these Next generation methodologies give you typically short sequences, which you then have to overlap computationally to make longer ones. And that's hard. It can be tricky, as you can imagine, to overlap them properly. Um, And if you need to really be accurate, you use another kind of 
sequencing that will give you long reads. So that will help you piece together the, the shorter reads. But they say here, they have a figure where they have, <clears throat> I actually don't understand all of the figure. On the y-axis, it says coverage. I don't know what that, I mean. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm assuming that's read depth. Read Reads, okay. And then uh, then on the, y, the x-axis is position in the spike uh, mRNA sequence, which is about what, 3,000 bases? Almost four. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, almost four it looks like because the reads go all the way up there. And then on the right y axis they have No, it's it's twelve seventy three. Yeah, no, it's twelve seventy three. That's the amino why do they acids. Have... That's amino acid, uh, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, these are the bases. Sorry, you're right. So what is twelve seventy three times three? Thirty six hundred, thirty seven hundred, okay. something like that. There you that. go, thank you. And then on the right y axis they have days after either Moderna or Pfizer. So then they have co different colors. And they say each colored plot is a single sample. So in other words, all the the first one on the bottom, which is day one, Moderna, dose one. So it's a day after getting Moderna. It's pink, and there are coverage uh, almost across the entire mRNA sequence, which makes sense because you got a lot of mRNA. You just got the shot, and it's in your blood, okay? Yeah, so I'm taking this as that these are the 10 patients. Yes, that and then, was yeah. So we're basically seeing yes. each one. So one of the patients happened to go in for their HCV testing one day after they exactly. got their first Moderna right. dose. Exactly. And then the next one up is uh, day five Moderna dose two. And there it looks like we have complete coverage of the whole sequence. They could put the whole thing together. And they said they actually had um, uh, complete coverage in, uh, in that one. And really extensive depth. Yeah, uh, a lot of depth too. Yeah, it goes up to forty thousand. Looks like so. The the more depth, as I said, the more uh, RNA there is. Then the next one up is Pfizer dose two on day thirteen, and now we just have one, two, three, four, five, five reads. It looks like across. So not a lot at day thirteen, and not much depth. Right. Telling me it's going down pretty quickly. Same thing with day 14. We have two reads, day 14, Pfizer, dose one. And then, oddly, day 15, we have more reads. This is dose one of Pfizer. But, you know, people are all different, right? right? So These are just individuals. No They're individuals. Then day 15, we have one, two, three, four, five reads. Day 21, we have three reads. Then day 22, we have one read. Day 23, we have two reads. And day 28, we have three reads. <laughs> and the coverage is dropping, by the yeah. way, as we're getting farther and farther out. And and they say, you know, in the in the text that if you get fewer reads, it means you have a lot less RNA around. Um, and so we don't know anything about the physical state of this RNA, right? It could be full length, but we don't know because we don't have enough reads to cover it. There's just not enough RNA in there to cover it. But what we do know is there's not a lot of RNA, and there was just one patient at day 28 who had <laughs> mRNA. There was one patient at day 23, one patient at day 22, um, one patient at day 21. You know, so I, I just think that there's not much RNA around <laughs> after a couple of weeks. And so to say that this is dangerous is just disingenuous, in my opinion. Even it's if there right. were a lot of RNA af uh, around after a couple of weeks, there's no uh, indication that that has any impact no. on no. the safety of the vaccine. The, vac the vaccines have been shown to be safe. They, yeah. s they say uh, they have a couple of things here. First of all, early in their results, they uh, discussion, they say, surprisingly, we found fragments of blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Uh, why should you necessarily be surprised? You don't know what to expect, really, because nobody's yeah. uh, really done this before. Though, actually, as you point out, Vincent, if uh, the, there is other literature on this that yeah. uh, says essentially the same thing. And then they say later on, we expect that the vaccine mRNA detected in plasma is contained within uh, uh, lipid nanoparticles. I don't see any reason necessarily to expect that. All right, yeah, and they say yeah. in samples where we observed only fragments, 
this would indicate that the concentration of uh, the lipid nanoparticles in the plasma is low. I don't think right. that necessarily follows either. Uh, that's sort of compound ifs. So to me, this looks like, I think it's interesting that you can get these uh, uh, five, uh, that there seems to be a correlation between, how, though it's not much data, there seems to be a correlation between how much sequence you get and how long it goes out. It seems to me as if the longer you wait, the less sequence there is, which is yeah. what you would expect. So, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, <laughs> The expectations may have been that the uh, sequences would clear faster than maybe these studies uh, suggest, but I don't see anything unusual or alarming about this. I mean, it's, uh, it's just data. As the um, person who wrote in said, this doesn't indicate that we've been, what is the word they used? Uh, misled. We're, no, not at all. Lied and manipulate. Lied to and manipulate. No. It's just to get no. a, that's just to get hits. Yeah. Um, so they do say. Uh, so this is funny. They say these findings are interesting. And I want to just point out that Jane Flint thinks that's a cop out to say something is interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do too. Yeah. She said, what, what's interesting? Tell us what's interesting about it. If you yeah. can't think of something, then don't. Say <laughs> <laughs> right, and what's interesting to you isn't necessarily interesting to everybody else. So yeah. that's exactly yeah. why you have to d describe that's what right. you think is. Anyway, these, and should lead to further research into the design and half-life. Why? They're safe. These vaccines are completely safe, almost completely safe. There's yeah. some myocarditis, but probably doesn't have anything to do with the RNA being around. Right? Yeah, they haven't told us anything about the liquid nanoparticle and whether the lipid is still there. Um, and so that we can't really say we should look at safety of the lipid because they haven't done any experiments yeah. on the lipid. They haven't done any experiments to show if this R mm -hmm. RNA that's circulating could, I don't know, get into a cell or make protein. Right now, all we know is there's some RNA yeah. around, and there's some RNA around the rest of your body encoding other things too. Yeah, it occurred to me as I was reading this that I don't know that anybody's ever done any experiments to look at what the half-life of RNA is just in general that's sort of introduced into plasma, okay? Why naked would they? RNA, just naked RNA, yeah, naked RNA, or even LNP RNA. Who, 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 you know, either, either yeah. way. Well, I mean, in their methods, they had to subtract off all of the human uh, sequence, right? That was in there before they actually could look for the Hep C or anything else. So presumably, there is human sequence there that they had to subtract off. So, Vincent, RNA is just as big a problem as DNA. It's everywhere. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but they say it should be emphasized that our data does not in any way, it should be do not, do not in any way change the conclusion that both mRNA vaccines are safe and effective. I agree. Yeah. I guess John didn't read that no, part of the paper. that doesn't fit his narrative. So I did find another paper. So there, there's an older paper where Drew uh, Weissman put these into mice, but that's not the lipid nanoparticle composition that Pfizer and Moderna are using because it's too long ago. So I'm not sure that that is uh, fair. So this one was in biomedicine. Vaccine mRNA can be detected in blood at 15 days post-vaccination. So this is a study in people. This is uh, 2022. So it's the mRNA, SARS-CoV-2 mRNA spike vaccines. And they say we use PCR to track mRNA in blood at different time points in a small cohort of healthy individuals. So here they do a time course. They, they pick people who are going to be vaccinated, and then they take uh, blood periodically. And they find that vaccine-associated RNAs persist in systemic circulation for at least two weeks. And they have a, a picture, a graph, showing that, that uh, it peaks a couple of days after vaccination, and it starts to go down. What they don't have in this paper, uh, though I didn't look into it carefully enough to see exactly what their primers uh, measuring, yeah, what their primers were. But they don't. Uh, the The nice thing about the other paper is that uh, you can see what fragments they amplify, yes. and and yes. I think that sort of enriches the perspective on it. Here, I'm not really sure what sort of shape this. 
uh, RNA is uh, in, whether we're just talking about bitty fragments. It's probably just one set of primers, so we're talking about one sequence or something, but I, I don't really know. Yeah, um, yeah, they use primers that are optimized to pick up spike, which are no, no doubt internal primers right. of some kind, right? And so how big the... Uh, the two custom candidate primers were designed for quantification. So you're just looking at one segment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the thing I did like about this paper was that they then went on and looked in some of the white blood cells yeah. to see if there was spike protein, um, both by some EM and some uh, a blot, a Western blot. And right. they showed that there wasn't protein production. So yeah. again... Maybe there's some of this RNA, but at least at a sort of first glance, they don't see protein production. Right. So I think, uh, you know, this is not a scary result at all. And I think if you want to really know how many people have RNA for how many days, you'd have to do a bigger study um, because 9.3% isn't fair for the reasons we said. And only a few people have it out, what, beyond 15 days? And it seems to be very low in terms of the read. So, And we don't know if it's reproducible, don't know even it's within reproducible. your own data set. And if anything special about the hep C, right? Maybe they're yeah. special in some way. So that's that. I just think they stumbled on it and they said, just publish it and not do anything else. <laughs> right. right. Have, have any of you heard of this journal before? I've never heard of no. it. Right. Never heard of it. Yeah. All right. Now on to a paper, which uh, is very interesting. No, um, it's not interesting. It's provocative <laughs> because it has cross-reactive uh, antibodies against a number of common endemic respiratory viruses. So I would say it's interesting because of the methods and the approach they use and also for the potential for treating people. So this is called cross-protective antibodies against common endemic respiratory viruses. It is by, it is in Nature Communications, Caban, Rodarte, Bibi, Gray, Taylor, Panchera, and Bunyara Takorn kit. Uh, that uh, and they're from the Fred Hutch Cancer Center and the University of Washington. So. Um, or respiratory syncytial virus has been in the news, as you know, but also uh, other respiratory viruses, human metanumovirus, human para-influenza viruses type 1 and 3 also cause significant infections. And, and they say these viruses collectively account for most of the respiratory viruses identified in hospital adults prior to 2020. It's four respiratory viruses, and they're also a big problem in immunocompromised people. Uh, they are a, a serious threat to them and in particular cause lower respiratory infections in hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients. So and then there are no vaccines against them. We, we, we are in development. RSV vaccines are in development, and we'll point out a couple of papers in a moment about those. Um, but these others, and of course, if you uh, are dealing with immunocompromised patients, a vaccine is probably not going to work for them. So you maybe want to do a, a monoclonal antibody therapeutic, and that's what that's what this is all about. Um, so uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, as you know, have been used <laughs> for different times in the, in the COVID uh, pandemic. There is a monoclonal against RSV, palivizumab, palivizumab. It was approved in 1998. This is for use in high-risk infants. And Daniel was talking about this yesterday. He said, well, hardly anyone uses it because it's too expensive. Yeah. It's like 25 grand a, yeah. a, a uh, treatment uh, or something? Uh, I don't know what it is now, but that was always my understanding was that it was exorbitantly expensive. Uh, however, other uh, antibodies, more potent ones, have progressed through clinical trials. Daniel was talking about those, and they, they say to replace um Palivizumab for high risk infants. And there, you know, 80% of bronchiolitis, as, and Paul Offit said this, is caused by RF, RSV. Um, so um, 
no, but there are no monoclonals for human metanumavirus or the parainfluenza one or three. So, uh, w what are these viruses? They're all negative stranded, enveloped viruses. Uh, the parainfluenza viruses are members of the paramyxoviridae family. The um, respiratory syncytial virus is a member of the pneumovirus family. And um, metanumoviruses, well, they used to be a subfamily of the paramyxoviridae, but they have been reclassified into the metanumoviruses, which is we like to reclassify things. Metanumo. But they're all enveloped negative stranded. And they're, viruses. you know, uh, they're, if, it, all you have to do is look at the genomes and realize mm -hmm. that these guys are all cousins, right? They are similar, cousins, yeah. similar sort of genetic composition, organization, replication lifestyle, et cetera. So they, they're all, they're on, all on a, a branch of the phylogenetic tree. They're, they're cousins. All of these viruses, so four of them we're talking about, RSV, metanumo, HPIV1 and 3, they have fusion proteins. Class 1, which means they're perpendicular to the membrane, they have other properties, which are essential for fusion. They're not the attachment protein, but they're the fusion protein. Is and, the, uh, is the um, coronavirus, <laughs> is SARS-CoV-2 a class 1 fusion protein? I get, yeah. I get these all mixed up. Perpendicular to the membrane and mainly alpha helical. Okay. Class two is parallel to the membrane, mainly beta sheets. Beta so the sheets. sort of general fuzzy conception one might have of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, one could apply to these. And, uh, yes. And th th as we'll see, the, the idea of using a prefusion form is also relevant here. Right. So F uh, HPIV 1 and 3... Uh, the F sequence is 65% amino acid homology. RSV and, and HP, HMPV, human metanumovirus, they're both pneumoviridae, and uh, their Fs are 64% homologous. And here's the, the kicker here. So F has to be cleaved in order to be fusogenic by a protease. And pre-F is the major confirmation of infectious virus particles. Once it's cleaved, it's going to be fusing and getting into cells. So antibodies to pre-F are the most uh, uh, potent at neutralizing virus. So that's why, uh, that's why we use pre-F uh, confirmation for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And so what they do in this paper is try and identify cross-reactive monoclonal antibodies. And uh, it's a cool strategy that they use um, a bait and switch strategy. So, and, and it starts with this interesting statement because virtually all humans have been exposed. We don't have to pre screen donors <laughs> for seropositivity. Yeah, like we just take blood and take out B cells, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they take, um, they, they isolate B cells that bind HPIV 3F. They take 200 million human splenocytes and they incubate them with tetramers of HPIV pre-F, pre-fusion confirmation, conjugated to allophycocyanin and tetramers of post-F because they want to get rid of those. They want to get rid of antibodies that bind to post-F. So, um, Brianne, I wanted to ask why they're using a, a tetramer here for this. Um, they're using a tetramer here largely to increase avidity. Okay. Um, so they might be able to have more than one B cell receptor on the B cell binding to an epitope because mm -hmm. they're providing four copies of the antigen. Got um, it. So that's going to going to give them stronger binding um, to the B cell and allow that uh, B cell to get sorted more easily. Um, so the B cells sort. have antibodies on their surface, and so they have the antigen as a tetramer, and then it's it's linked to a, something that can be sorted, right? It, it's linked to a fluorescent molecule, um, and then they can use their cell sorter to mm -hmm. sort any cells that are fluorescent, um, which means that they bound right. to the antigen. So they look for 
for B cells that bind pre-F but not post-F. Right. So I got the impression from this that I hadn't ever had before that tetramer is sort of a generic word. It can be made up of different kinds of proteins to make your tetramers. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So, so really a tetramer means that you have four copies of whatever your antigen is. Most of the time when, pe when immunologists talk about tetramers, they talk about MHC class one peptide tetramers okay. to um, look for T cells. Uh, in my life, it was class one and CD8 T cells, but it, it's really taking advantage of biotin streptavidin interactions and the fact that you can get four <laughs> um, interactions there. Okay. So they got 900 B cells that bind pre-F, this is HPIV3 pre-F, but not post-F. They put them one by one into wells with feeder cells so that they make antibodies. Okay, and so, then they so I got it. I, I have to, uh, <laughs> this paper is technically, technologically blowing my mind, okay? So I have to ask, Bri I have to check in with Brianne on this. Vincent just sells, uh, just said, sort these B cells one by one into individual wells of feeder cells. So are we talking about like a 96 well dish with a single B cell in yep. a well and the feeder cells are, have, are genetically altered in such a fashion that they induce these B cells to make antibody uh, more, so, right? Yeah. So basically, um, if I were setting this up, I haven't set up an experiment like this in a while. Um, perhaps I, w I would do exactly as you said in terms of I would sort out one B cell per well of the plate. Um, and then I would add in my feeder cells, which, as you say, are genetically modified to produce the right growth factors to allow those B cells to become antibody secreting cells. So, but the, uh, I mean, the, you got to have a single cell per well because you're looking yep. for monoclonals, right? Yep. Yeah, um, right. Uh, but the B cells are. They don't divide, right? You still just got one cell. Um, I think they do divide. Okay. Um, and so you, but you get a clone of B cells that okay. all came from that same one cell to start okay. with. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then you take the supernate, which has the antibodies, and you do neutralization assays. They actually do plaque formation. Yay! And two out of nine hundred <laughs> make antibodies that can neutralize. So remember, these are HPIV3 binding um, B cells. Then they they see if they can neutralize HPIV1. So want cross reactive antibodies, and they find that two out of nine hundred can neutralize HPIV1. And I don't know if you said this, but the problem is that they don't have they can't express prefusion HPIV1 fusion protein. So they right. couldn't look to see if these B cells actually bound the protein. So they said, okay, instead we'll just do the neutralization assays on the real virus. Okay. Right, right. And then they clone out the heavy and light chains so they can then make antibodies. Yeah, go ahead. So I wanted to know why they do that. They have these two antibodies. Why do they have to clone out the heavy and light chains separately and so forth? Um, my guess for why they do that is so that then they can examine the genes in more detail, um, find out more about those heavy and light chains, and maybe in a future study make modifications on them. Um, I think it's more so that they can actually start to do the analysis they do, but then later on, if they wanted to, they could do some modifications. Okay, so for instance, in the one that they call 3X1, um, there's, they're going to put it back together, the same heavy chain and the same light chain, and get 3X1 back. Right. From what they started with. Right. Yeah. Okay. Again, mind blown. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, cool. I, I realize I realize that this is becoming, in quotes, in air quotes, commonplace. But you know, it used to be you would do fusions of your B cell with some oh, immortalized yeah. cell to get yeah. a hybridoma that would make your antibody. Now we skip all that now, right? We just clone them. Yeah. Well, and you also couldn't do a sort to get your individual B cells, and so you'd have to do limiting dilution. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, Brian, would the B cells uh, grow? They're not transformed. They won't grow forever, right? They won't grow forever, but they will grow for a while, especially now that we know about what those cytokines are. Okay. That the so maybe another to reason to clone the genes is to be able to produce them forever. Sure. Yeah. And then they also say here uh, that one of these clones 
uh, which did cross neutralize both. It's called three three x one or three times one for PIV three one. <laughs> that ha that was IgA, so they wanted to switch it to IgG. Yeah. So that's what that's they could the do reason. by having the clone, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you do your own clone clone mediated class switching, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Clone mediated class switching. Yeah. So that's you can good. put the the heavy chain and the light chain variable regions onto. Uh, whatever constant region you want, or you could put it onto some kind of modified constant region if you wanted to. I'm just so happy that I can understand this and that I'm alive to witness it because it's <clears throat> amazing. It is. It's cool stuff. Very cool stuff. So is other stuff, yeah. you know, like that RNA where you wrap up the intestine and slice it and you do RNA <laughs> C2 thing, remember? Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, Stephanie that Karst, was Stephanie right? Stephanie Karst, right. That's very cool. Yeah. It's like a um, one of those pastries that yeah. you, you roll <laughs> yeah, it up. That's what, it, that's what it's called, is making Swiss roll of the intestine. Swiss roll. Swiss yeah. roll. And uh, I, think, I think deep sequencing is cool, too, and the, the, the computational analysis. It's, all, it's just amazing. I mean, I, I just remember taking a year to sequence polio genome, yeah. Rich, yeah. running these big friggin' gels yeah. that, you know, three feet long and a couple feet wide— Huge plates. They had to siliconize to make sure that the gel didn't stick. What a pita! Yeah, that uh, I, I. Whenever I think about that, I think about you know the really treacherous part was getting the gel off the plate onto a piece of Wattman to dry it. You know. Yeah, that was hard because if you broke it, you lost yeah. everything. But you know, we're complaining. <laughs> I I came on the scene, and maybe Kathy remembers before. Us, they had to run tube protein gels and slice them all up. <laughs> I had to splice them. But but we also had a way perfected to get the gel off the plate and onto the paper. It worked like a charm every time. So yeah. that, that was not a problem People for come up with their own little solutions. Yeah. yeah. It's very cool. Uh, all right. So then... Um, so they study the uh, the affinity of this antibody and its neutralization ability, and and they they basically conclude that it's there must be an epitope that's conserved between these two viruses, which which makes perfect sense. And I, I have to just say, in the end, we're not going to actually know <laughs> about the conserved epitope. Spoiler we're going to get some alert. we're going to get some clues, but we're not going to actually know in the end uh, how this thing is uh, cross protective. All right, so then they do some cryo EM structures. Um, uh, they they um, say that okay, so we we they do cross competition binding to see where the antigenic sites are on H uh, PIV three because that's not real characterized. And they say this one three times one doesn't seem to overlap previously identified antibodies, but it did o overlap one called P thirteen A twelve and. So they used cryo EM to see how these two sites of three times one and P13 are overlapping. They do cryo EM, uh, and they get a structure of of the antibody together with HPIV3. Um, they also get um, a bunch of other stuff, but they could not determine from this <laughs> if the if the antibodies overlap or not, and whether they bind distinct epitopes. I read this like ten times to try and get a message. And there is, they said they don't know what the nature of the epitope is. One of the clues, though, is that uh, three times one uh, binds a cleft uh, in the virus uh, in the F protein, which they say is crucial for the pre to post F rearrangement. So that tells me that maybe this is stopping that rearrangement, and that's why it's neutralizing. Right. Vincent, I thought the MRA was the message. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The medium is the message, right? Marshall McLuhan. Marshall that's McLuhan. Right. That's right. So I guess what's what's missing here is that, as we already said, they don't have the other fusion protein. Uh, yeah, that's available because right. the what what would be nice is to solve the structure of the uh, antibody bound to the other fusion protein, so right. that you could say you know say more about the potential overlap. <clears throat> between the two. And uh, there's only, so I guess we don't even have a structure for that other protein if, no, if it don't. hasn't been expressed. And there's only, what, on these, uh, is this the, these are the ones where there's 65% amino acid homology. 
Uh, this is one of yeah. these interesting cases where <clears throat> that doesn't sound like a whole lot, actually, of amino acid homology, but there's probably a lot more structural homology. Yes, uh, but we don't know yes. what. But we don't know what it is. Yeah. All right. So moving on to RSV and human metanumovirus. Basically, do the same thing, right? Same kind of screen that we talked about before. They take B cells uh, from patients, and they get a um, uh, they get an antibody. They clone out the heavy and light chains, and so they basically find one that can bind both RSV and human metanumovirus. Clone it. It's called MXR. Okay, metanumo and RSV, and um, they produce it as an IgG1, just like the other one. And in this case, they have uh, <laughs> both fusion proteins available in the prefusion That's right. form. That's and right. there's this, uh, in the on, along the same line of mind being blown, there's this wonderful uh, mm -hmm. panel, uh, sorting panel in figure 3B, where they uh, uh, sort in two dimensions against both proteins. And in the place where you would get binding of both, there is a single cell. <laughs> that they pull out of Indeed. how many hundred thousand cells to start with that they then amplify and do all this stuff on. Reminds me of the cloning of hepatitis C virus, remember? Uh, Does anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, what I remember, uh, no, I don't I, I don't know exactly what you're thinking All right, of. so they had, they took, Kathy, just correct me if I'm wrong, they took blood from a hep C person, they gave it to a chimp. The chimp developed hep C, chimp developed antibodies, and they used those antibodies to screen lambda expression library oh. for the protein, and one, they got one positive. I think that's right, yeah. Michael Houghton at Chiron, I think, or, yeah, I think it was Chiron. Yeah. And from that started the whole field. <laughs> one, one positive. It's the same as that. All right, so we have MXR, um, they compared it to some other antibodies that are under development. Uh, one is called D25 or near Sevimab. This is for infants. And as Kathy said at the very beginning, there are two antigenic subtypes of RSV A and B. 91% amino acid homology within F. Listen to this. MXR bound irreversibly to pre-F of both RSV subtype A and B irreversibly, KD less than 10 to the minus 12th molar. That's a that's powerful. That's yeah. some powerful affinity, that's folks. That's good binding. <laughs> Even my math poor brain can appreciate that. They compare this with all these other antibodies that are out there, and this one is better, basically, of all of them. And it, this is also combined F, of course, pre-F of uh, H human metanumovirus as well as RS virus. Um, well, they, okay. com they compared to uh, antibodies they already had that bound to RS. They didn't have any other ones that previously bound to metanumovirus. That's right. Or, so that not only did this have amazing binding, it had this bonus of binding to more than one virus. They also said, okay, what about neutralization? <clears throat> so they take the two subtypes of uh, RSV and they compare it with Pelivizumab. Uh, the more I say it, the better I'm getting yeah, at it. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> Pelivizumab. Uh, is that the right way? Pelivizumab? I think so. Sounds good. Um, MXR neutralized subtype A with sixfold greater potency compared to Pelivizumab. Pelivizumab has a similar potency against both subtype. MXR was highly potent against subtype B with 12 fold greater potency. Uh, and then it goes on. But basically, it's, MXR is really good for both viruses, better than palivizumab. So now we have two antibodies, each one against two, uh, neutralizing two viruses, a pair of viruses. They do a cryo-EM structure of MXR bound to RSV. And they say it binds primarily to what's called antigenic site 3, which is a quaternary epitope. Really complicated epitope found uh, formed by a lot of protein folding, right? Parts of one protomer and parts of another uh, on the of the uh, of the F protein. 
Um, and again, there's a lot of words here about this structure, but it's not clear to me that in the end they figure out why it's cross-reactive. Do, do you agree with me, or do you have some insight that I lack? I have no further insight. Because <laughs> I, 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 I don't know how this, and in the end they say we have to do more work to figure yeah. it out. Okay, so we'll leave that behind. There's some pretty pictures here if you can get to the text. Now we do some animal studies. I mean, my, pres my presumption is that there's, we're looking at conserved epitopes. Uh, and so that when you have all the, st the structures solved at the ultimate resolution, you'll see that yeah. they're, you know, they're binding to these conserved episode, epitopes and we'll work out the full resolution. All right, so what animal do you use for these viruses? Parainfluenzas don't reproduce in mice. They will reproduce in hamsters and cotton rats. <laughs> RSV will grow in hamsters and cotton rats. So they decided to use hamsters because all these virus, all four viruses reproduce in hamsters. So they tried both monoclonals, MXR and 3X1. I guess it's M times R and 3 times 1. I don't know. I think it's X. I X? like X. Yeah. yeah. Sure. We can go with that. Golden Syrian hamsters. And this is a prophylaxis. They're going to give the antibody and then challenge them, which is what you do with every shell, right? You give people an antibody, and then they go out in the world, and then after some months, well, when we used to use every shell, I guess. And to make the distinction, that's as distinguished from a therapeutic. A right. prophylactic you would give before the infection, a therapeutic you would give after. They don't, right. they don't, they don't test these as a therapeutic. They don't, yeah. Although you can use monoclonals therapeutically for sure, right? right? You could use convalescent serum. And given how well these work, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they yeah. had therapeutic value. All right, so intramuscular injections of the antibody two days before intranasal infection, and they harvest the lungs, the nasal turbinates, and they see uh, what, what did these antibodies do against infection? Pretty good, and they tr compare it to uh, palivizumab. So you're giving intramuscular injections, and so the antibody ends up in the serum, and they gave five milligrams per kilogram of MXR or 3X1, fully suppressed replication of HI HPIV3 and RSV, respectively, in the lungs. Palivizumab at the same concentration did not suppress uh, replication in the lungs or in the, all right, so it, or in the lungs. Uh, administration of 3X1 had little impact on replication in navel, nasal turbinates, but um, it reduced replication of RSV in turbinates. So they left out HPIV in that sense, but, but so that was HPIV, but nasal turbinates, upper tract was impaired very nicely by um, MXR. Palivizumab had no effect on RSV replication in the nasal turbinates. How about in the lungs? Um, they they tested the same dose. The HPIV1 was completely blocked, replication completely blocked in the lungs of all but one animal, reduced the nasal, nasal turbinates. I keep saying navel turbinates, nasal turbinates. <laughs> And HPMV was reduced by t over 200-fold in lungs of hamsters that got MXR. Okay, so these are all done separately. What about if you made a cocktail? You know, you mix them all together. Do you like the word cocktail for antibodies, or should that be reserved for mixed drinks that humans consume? <laughs> I think it's too late, hey, Vincent. Ka Kathy, what do you I, think? Do you like cocktail? I, I agree with Rich. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> okay. It doesn't matter whether we like it or not. I mean, I'm you know, I make an enzyme cocktail when I'm setting yeah, up a true. bunch of PCR reactions. I think it's yeah. just like wishful thinking. I, I yeah. think I've been making antibody cocktails since I was an undergraduate, so. Yeah, you know, we like to use words like that. It's fine. I don't mind. Okay, so um, they they want to be able to treat people um, with both antibodies to get all four viruses, right? So they have a, a co they made a co-infection model in hamsters, HPIV three RSV, and that they could give MXR and three X one, and they say here, I read that plaque assay 
could not distinguish between the two viruses, so we used PCR. I was so sad. <laughs> but then it, they, they do come back to a plaque uh -huh. assay later. But you could imagine doing some clever things to, to distinguish, right? Well, maybe they could use some kind of antibody, you know, fluorescent antibody. antibody. Yeah, yeah, fluorescence, plus. or maybe a cell that would distinguish between the two. Who knows, right? We did that with polio. We could use different cells to distinguish. Anyway, they, um, they use PCR to look at viral uh, RNA loads. So um, HPIV3 and RSV co-infect animals, right? Uh, they didn't see any decrease in replication in lungs simultaneously inoculated with equal amounts of both viruses compared to single. So they're not interfering with each other. Okay, that's good. And then they give hamsters, I am this cocktail of MXR and 3X1 two days before um, giving the hamsters intranasally uh, HPIV3 and RSV. Harvest lungs and turbinates five days no, the cocktail did not impact HPIV3 replication in the turbinates, but reduced viral load in the lungs by over 88-fold. The cocktail reduced viral load, RSV viral load in the lungs and the turbinates by 17 and 2.9-fold. So not a big effect in turbinates. And then they did a plaque assay to, um, you know, look at the total uh, the, both both viruses together, and you could see that the cocktail reduced combined viral replication in the lungs to undetectable level and six-fold in nasal turbinates. So, Brian, what's the problem with the turbinate? Is it a problem getting the antibody from the muscle to the nasopharynx? Is that it? I guess so. Um, I'm not really sure. One thing I was looking at was that in both of these experiments, they're looking at the lungs and nasal turbinates at day five. Mm. And part of me wondered whether... Um, that's just, you know, the virus has done its thing in the nose. You know, if, if it's going to replicate, it's replicated in the nose by day five. I, I just sort of yeah. wondered if day five was the right time for nasal turbinates, but I don't know enough about this to be real yeah. sure. Well, there you go. We have two antibodies that will do uh, together all four of these viruses. And in, they, in, in, in hamsters, it looks pretty good. And so um, what are we going to do with these? Well, I wonder, well, we're going to, hopefully, they're good enough uh, and we can make them in, sufficiently inexpensive so that we can uh, certainly use them prophylactically on immunocompromised individuals who are susceptible to this. And I would hope that down the road they may even have therapeutic value. Yeah. Uh, and I also, as, as, as we were discussing this, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, the next pandemic uh and <laughs> how are we gonna how are we gonna deal with it uh we need to be able to to quickly develop vaccines and therapeutics and i wonder how quickly this can be done because clearly the technology is getting to the point uh where uh it's a uh, relatively relatively keyword relatively straightforward process uh to get out to make a monoclonal antibody against something. CEPI's new goal is to be able to uh, con uh, uh, confront a novel pathogen within 100 days. Okay, so I wonder, if, uh, I wonder if this is something that could potentially be deployed as at least one arm of defense against uh, a new pathogen in a pretty short period of time. I, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I'm thinking about it. You, you'd have to be able to get B cells in decent quantity from seropositive individuals, which yeah. wasn't a challenge here because everyone has been infected with these viruses. Yeah. Um, so the question I think for me, the only question for me is, could you actually get B cells at a high enough quantity that you could sort out these rare um, neutralizing yeah. antibodies? You know, I don't think it's quick because we haven't had a new monoclonal in a while to match, you know, some of the Omicron variants. It's been months, many months. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure they're working on it, but I don't think it's 100 days. Because you know? we should have a new Evia shell to match Omicron subvariants, right? But we don't. It also occurs to me that probably, now check me on this, Brianne, 
your best antibodies are going to be ones that have had uh, an opportunity to mature, right? Correct. So mm. that may take some time. Mm -hmm. mm. Yep. <laughs> so that's where the convalescent serum can help. Yeah. Kathy to the rescue. <laughs> for, for RSV is what he's referring to. Oh, I was wondering. Well, uh, what did what did Arturo say? They ask you if you've had COVID, and that's it. They don't actually check neutralization. They just check levels of antibodies, and that correlates pretty well with in people who say they've had COVID with neutralizing antibodies. But they say here, candidates together, uh, MXR and 3X1 represent promising MAB candidates for further development to protect against a broad array of respiratory viral infections in high, highly vulnerable patient populations. I don't know if four is a broad array. Is four a broad array? Just four. Why don't they say four? Four respiratory viral infections. Maybe they would work for some others. I don't know. But um, it sounds to me they can go into further into clinical development now. Yeah. I suppose they yeah. do some animal, some more animal studies. You know, make sure it's uh, not toxic and all that stuff, and eventually get into people. I think that's very exciting. So the, those are why this is interesting to us. <laughs> Indeed, but Rich, I think uh, the expense of this relates very much to how much research they put into it to begin with, and it's not how much it costs to produce the monoclonals; it's how much can you recover by selling it for as high a price as possible. You know, like the insulin uh, thing with Eli Lilly, they just recently came down to $35 a month for something that was producing for mm -hmm. them for years and years and years. They've more than paid for the research on that one. Well, there was an interesting, this is a bit of a sidetrack here, but there was an interesting story about that on, I believe it was on the news hour the other night, that yeah, pointed out that, that when... Uh, Humulin, when the uh, you know cloned insulin first came out, that was uh, twenty one dollars a month. Yes, you're and right. it's when That's the right. insurance companies and the and the uh, uh, insurance hmm. company brokers became involved that the price really escalated. Um, yep. uh, and so it's a it has to do as much with insurance companies and that whole. Uh, and the insurance company brokerage things, the, the brokers that that uh, pair up the insurance companies with the, uh, with the providers, that winds up jacking up the price. Uh, hmm. And it just, it's enough to drive me crazy. And they keep, yep. throughout this broadcast, they keep talking about how, you know, the problem is with the uninsured individuals. And I keep thinking there shouldn't be any uninsured individuals. Yeah. <laughs> drives me nuts. Yep. So for comparison, uh, there are two papers in New England Journal on RS virus <clears throat> vaccines for older adults. And the first one, respiratory syncytial virus prefusion F protein vaccine in older adults. I just want to mention briefly the the approach here. So this is a uh, uh, aluminum sulfate adjuvanted prefusion F protein based candidate vaccine. You guys hear, by the way, that Novavax might go out of business? Ooh. No. I heard from you. <laughs> yes. Bloomberg <laughs> reports that they say we don't think we can remain uh, viable for a year. They're bleeding money. Isn't that too bad? Yeah, that's too bad. Because it's a good. Vaccine and, and maybe other people will take it who don't want to take mRNA vaccines. Well, not only that, but the, the the company is you know heavily invested in uh, uh, protein based vaccines, and that's yeah. you know it's a strategy that we need to maintain. Anyway, so that's what this one of these two vaccines is a protein based, which uh, it is. They gave it to uh, you know it's a phase three trial. It was a placebo arm of adults sixty years or older. And the primary objective, vaccine efficacy of one dose against lower tract disease, confirmed by RT-PCR during one RSV season. Lower tract disease. Uh, so um, what are the results? 25,000 participants, 6.7 months follow-up. Vaccine efficacy of, against RT-PCR confirmed lower tract disease was 82%. In the vaccine group, and uh, 
well, it's 82%. They had uh, seven cases in the vaccine group and 40 cases in the placebo group. Wow. It's pretty good. Yep. And it was 94% against severe lower tract disease. Mm. And the, you know, this is all clinical signs that they're looking at here. And it was similar against RSV A and B, similar efficacy. And, of course, the vaccine was more reactogenic than placebo, but most of the adverse events were transient. So that's cool. It's a protein-based vaccine, phase three. So, And, and, and this one, uh, the authors are from GSK. And so my assumption was that this was what the FDA meeting for the GSK vaccine was mm. about this week. But I haven't looked up the <clears throat> documents that went into that FDA meeting to Could be. make yeah. that for sure. And then we have a second NG, NEJM paper, Efficacy and Safety of an AD26 RSV pre-F protein vaccine <clears throat> in older adults. So now this is vectored, but it's pre-F of uh, RSV. And this is, again, a, a <clears throat> blinded, random, randomized trial, 65 years of, of age or older. And the, the primary endpoint, lower tract disease, um, Confirm lower tract disease. All right, 5,700 participants. And let's see, vaccine efficacy, 80%, 75 and 69% for, for the three different case definitions. Case definition one was uh, three or more symptoms of lower tract disease. Case, case definition two, two or more symptoms. <laughs> and case definition three, either two or more or one or more. Plus, Plus systemics. And, oh my gosh, it's so complicated. I like the other one better. <laughs> well, this uh, this uh, this vaccine is um, actually it's interesting. It's actually a cocktail, if you like, of the ad vectored pre F protein plus 150 micrograms of protein itself. And they don't. Oh, that's right. It is. And they it's don't protein, say yeah. whether or not there's an adjuvant there, uh, but yeah. uh, other I kind of chase that around a little while. I mean, it could be that the adenovirus itself could serve as an ad, uh, as an adjuvant, even for the protein yeah. vaccine. Uh, but uh, the uh, other studies looking at the protein by itself say that it doesn't work well without an adjuvant of some sort. And, and this one was funded by Janssen. Right. So at the bottom of the first page, yeah. it tells you it's the Cyprus trial and it was funded by Janssen. And the so other that's one their... indeed was funded by uh, GSK. So, Is that the same vector that was in the COVID vaccine yes. by Janssen? I, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that had problems, right? Well, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, I just before the show had some correspondence with an acquaintance of mine who was with Jansen, and is now with Novavax, uh, about about this whole thing, <laughs> uh, because every time I think about the adenovirus thing, I think about the uh, rare, albeit uh, extant, thrombosis side effect. Yeah, that's like yeah. it's like one and a half a million or something like that. Um, and wasn't that in younger? It was in folks, females, was and it was okay. younger females. Yes, I believe yeah. that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not exclusively, but uh, that that was that was the trend, and we we followed this kind of thing around because that was that was a you know under study for a while, uh, and so that uh, it turns out that adenoviruses generally, I, or I don't know if it's general, but it's true for ad five, ad twenty six, and chimp adenovirus. Uh, all uh, bind platelet factor four, which mm. is a clotting regulatory factor, so that uh, has the potential to dysregulate clotting, and that presumably accounts for the thrombosis. And then we uh, did another paper that actually solved a structure for the binding between adenovirus capsids and platelet factor four. Uh, and I believe that same paper showed that you could... Uh, Kathy's looking skeptical here. <laughs> um, are you sure it's four? It's not protein nine or? Uh... I thought it was platelet factor four. Okay. But I, I could be wrong. 
Yeah, it's PF4, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, they solved the structure yes. of the complex between adenovirus yeah. and PF4, and I believe that same paper may have uh, identified right. changes that you could make in the capsid so it would no longer bind. And I remember us discussing that if we were in the business of adenovirus vectors, <laughs> we'd be working on a vector that wouldn't bind PF4. Now, That's right. now mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's a, a, a chain of assumptions here. The assumption is that it's the binding of the adenovirus capsid to, plate, uh, capsid to platelet vector 4 that is essential for this thrombosis, and I don't think anybody's proven that, okay? But, you know, hmm. adenovirus vectors are getting used for lots of different stuff. So if I was in the ad business, I would have a, a department <laughs> that was working on engineering an adenovirus, that studied this problem, and was working on engineering an adenovirus that didn't do this. Uh, but to my knowledge, yeah. that's not happening. Because the Janssen vaccine was is not really used in the U.S. Well, remember? for that reason. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But the 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 problem is that this only this this is the kind of thing that's so rare that it only shows up when you distribute your uh, your ad based uh, therapeutic to millions of people. Yeah. Correct. The the Janssen was the same as the J and J. Yeah. Yes. Right. So yes. it was used initially in the U.S. Yes. Correct. That's right. Okay. That's right. But I think it's really tailed off. Oh yeah. <laughs> after that, Janssen basically is the company that does this that was bought by J and J. Right. Okay. So it's the same thing. So I presume these two vaccines are going to be reviewed by the FDA and. Uh, the, I believe the GSK one was one of the two that was reviewed yeah. this week. So maybe they'll be licensed in the next few. I don't know, months. And and Daniel said that Pfizer, he said it on the program the other night, so it's okay to say this. Pfizer's been working on a vaccine for infants. You immunize the mother in the second, third trimester, and then the, the baby is protected. They have some data on that. Actually, he, he gave it in his um, clinical update. Right. So the, because um, I was trying to figure out if, if this uh, ad 26 thing was related to the Pfizer one. But in fact, the Pfizer one for older adults is called Renoir. That's the clinical trial name. And the N-O of yes. Renoir is for in older adults. And then the one for <laughs> maternal immunization, they they call it Matisse. Matisse, yeah. So they're in this uh, My goodness. art yeah. uh, thing for their... I like Clinical Matisse. Trial. Yeah, I remember that. I like that. Um, let me tell you, um, I'll pull up Daniel's thing. Uh, what's yesterday? The third, second, March 2nd. I can tell you the numbers. He, he did read them off. And um, here we go. <laughs> By the way, FDA just approved a a test, an at-home test to uh, detect flu and COVID and, and SARS-CoV-2. And the company uh, yeah. is going, the company is now going out of business. Oh. So they proved it, but the company's going out of business. All right, where's the infant thing? Here we go. Yeah, Matisse. Uh, the um, It's a bivalent prefusion vaccine candidate. 81% efficacy against severe medically attended lower tract illness due to RSV in infants from birth through the first 90 days of life, 69% through the first six months of life. And so then at six months, you could get your own vaccine. <laughs> it's not bad, right? Yeah, no, that's six great. Uh, okay. And the one that nobody can determine the structure for is the Jackson Pollock. <laughs> Good, <laughs> Dixon. Good. I think you have that at home, uh, Brianne, right? I, I do have some Jackson Pollock uh, prints at home. These are, of course, reproductions. You yes. don't have originals. I do not. All right, let's do one round of email. Um, uh, Kathy, can you take the first one, please? Sure. Eric writes, hi, Twivers. I'm an avid Twiv fan and just listened to episode 983 with Scott Hensley. One of the things he mentioned is the paper showing that elderly people who had survived the 1918 pandemic as children are still able to produce an immune response to the 1918 strain 90 years later. But it strikes me that considering this fact to be evidence of a long-lasting immune memory response is overly optimistic. 
In TWIV 966, Jeffrey Taubenberger asserted that all current strains of influenza are descended from the 1918 epidemic strain. If this is the case, then surely someone who survived the 1918 pandemic would have had their immune memory boosted many times by repeated exposure to descendant strains. Further, imprinting, or as Hensley would phrase it, original anagenic sin, would seem to make it likely that exposure to descendant strains disproportionately raised sensitivity to the parts of the original strain which are preserved in descendant strains. Similarly, if someone tests one of the survivors of the original 2020 COVID-19 strain 90 years from now, I would expect that they would find an immune response if only because it is likely that descendants of our past and current COVID-19 strains will be circulating for at least the next 90 years. <laughs> and that fact will mean that the immune response to the strain of original exposure will likely be repeatedly boosted. However, I'm not a virologist, just an interested non-scientist who loves both the informative parts of TWIV and the friendly banter. So please tell me, am I thinking about this incorrectly? Best wishes, Eric. So, I th yeah, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> no, you go. I, I was going to say yes, Eric. I think that I think you're thinking about this correctly. Um, that some of the uh, papers about the long-lived memory in humans um, have different uh, controversy and different debates in the field. Um, the one that I use, there's one that I usually cite um, that shows uh, a similar. I think it only shows 75 years, um, but it is specifically looking at um, responses to smallpox vaccine with the idea that you wouldn't have to worry about this circulation. Uh, and that's why I always cite that paper instead of some of these papers, um, but because there definitely is that problem. Um, in fact, one reason why I'm so excited about a uh, paper that came out recently about the length of um, memory response persistence in mice because they didn't have to worry about some of those same kind of issues. But but the this descendant all strains have descended from 1918, so it's not just the external protein genes that are descended; it's internal genes. And in fact, so the 1918 H1 circulated until uh, 1957, but it changed over those years. And in 57, it was the H was H1 was swapped out for an H2. But there were internal genes that were still from 1918. That's why he says all current strains and the H3N2s continue to circulate. Uh, sorry, 1957 was H2N2, so it was swapped out for an H2. And then 1968, it was an H3. But internal genes continued to be uh, present there, so they are descended that way, but not always the H1. The H1 left in 1957. It reappeared in 2009 from pigs that had been infected in 1918, and it circulated in them all those years with minimal antigenic drift. Wow. And that's why when it came back into people, um, the only people who did not get infected were those who survived the 1918 pandemic. And so the implication being that it did change substantially in humans shortly after that, I suppose. And so uh, that's why those people lived. So. So even I'm not though, sure it, that. It, it, uh, so you're saying that even though you can say that all strains are descended from the 1918, that doesn't necessarily apply to the to the uh, epitopes, the that's immunology. Right. That's right. Okay. That's what I mean. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think that that is totally true, but it, it, <laughs> it still puts a little caveat on this study because you can't say that that person did not ever see that epitope between 1918 and 1957 or yeah, 2009 sure. and 2020. Yeah, I don't know how much it changed and, and whether everything, whether every H1 between 1918 and 1957 yeah. stimulated memory or made new B cells. We don't know, right? Yeah. I also wonder whether the, uh, you know, original COVID strains are going to be around 90 years from now. Well, that's uh, another uh, question. Depending right? on how you define it, original, like... Yeah. Where's the Wuhan strain now? I don't know that it's anywhere. Okay. It's probably in deer. <laughs> oh, <good>. Actually. <laughs> I bet mink. it's in deer. Actually. Right? Or mink. <laughs> or somewhere. I bet yeah. it's in nature because the deer seem to be uh, harboring yeah. a lot of these guys. 
But yeah, it might not change all that much. Who knows? I'm not going to know. I'm not going to be here in 90 ne- years. Not, not even Brianne's going to be here in 90 no, years. No, I won't either. But Eric, so, clearly you're paying attention. It's good. Okay, and it's great. That's right. Uh, Brianne? Sure. David writes, on TWIV 983, you repeated an outdated lament that industry ignores the development of antivirals because there is no market for them. In 2021, three of the top 20 selling drugs worldwide were antivirals. That's in addition to three vaccines targeting viruses and doesn't include blockbuster drugs like Sovaldi, Harvoni, and Tamiflu. The future looks bright for antivirals. Many unmet needs with large potential markets, obvious drug targets, powerful new AI, ML, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, drug discovery, and design tools. No concerns about on-target toxicity and improved diagnostics so you can get the right antiviral early when it will be the most effective. This is in sharp contrast to antimicrobials where there is a real problem with market market incentives. Antibacterial and antifungal drug development is a much harder problem. Microbes have been waging chemical warfare against each other for eons and are very good at resisting, degrading, excreting antibiotics. Um, And he gives a link. When a new antibiotic is developed, we have infectious disease committees rationing use, essentially guaranteeing that there will be no market for the drug. And then new antibiotics are released to the ag market and used in massive quantities, more or less guaranteeing that resistance will develop. It's a problem. One potential route forward are nonprofit consortia like the TB Alliance, which has developed a recently FDA-approved new antimicrobial drug, Predomanid. Um, and he gives a link. Uh, and uh, so thanks, David. And he is from um, Angstrom Bio. I, I, I didn't actually say that. <laughs> I said that we didn't have drugs ready for COVID-2 because after SARS-1, uh, it was over, and, and so there was no market for drugs. I was just talking about specifically that, because if you it took a while to get molnupiravir and remdesivir and Paxlovid going, we didn't have anything ready. But I agree that the overall it's a good market. But you know, if there's a market, then companies will make drugs. But you know, after SARS one, there was no more epidemic coronavirus, so there were no drugs. Yeah, as I, reco- I- as I recall, your complaint was that there are, you know, there should be. Um, uh, there should be research into um, drugs that are good on potential pathogens. So there's no current yeah. market for those guys. All yeah. right. That's where you need the government to step in, like in warp speed, and or, fund the stuff that the uh, that is really too risky for the pharmaceutical. Or SEPI or Ready, or right? Or, those yeah. kind of nonprofits, Any, yeah. right? Dixon, can you take the next one? Sure. James writes, hello, love and look forward to your clinical updates. Unfortunately, it seems that the same folks are pushing it beyond COVID-19. Despite the science, apparently the money is good. He quotes an article in the Washington Post that says that ivermectin can be used for COVID, flu, and RSV. (laughs) Keep up the good work, James. Oh, my gosh. Unbelievable. Uh, There was an article in the New York Times um, this morning, it was a, a an opinion by uh, one of their staff opinion guys, uh, Dana Milbank, uh, reporting on a meeting of this new uh, Senate or uh, House committee to look into the pandemic. And I will just say, actually, don't read it because it's too depressing. Uh, it's just. <sighs> All of the uh, c- uh, conspiracy tropes being dragged out and given air, and witnesses who are lunatics. Um, it's, <laughs> it's really too. It's really too bad. I guess this is a good place to say, beware. Okay, put on your critical thinking cap, and when you see stuff coming out of some of these uh, committees, um, make sure that you use your TWIV acquired knowledge to mm. ask questions carefully and ask, is this true or is it not? It's a good point. And with that, Rich, can you take the next one? Sure. George writes, I enjoyed the piece on CCP. That is, uh, uh, I'm not good at this. COVID. COVID convalescent convalescent plasmid. Plasma. Plasma. (laughs) 
with uh, Dr. Plasma. Arturo uh, <laughs> Casadabel. Good to have conf uh, good to have confirmed my impression that the reason that studies of treatments such as CCP were so unimpressive was due to the long duration between COVID infection and treatment. That is, you got to treat early. I never expected any antiviral treatment to work well after a week of illness. I have some problems with some of Dr. Casadaval's statements, however. He implied that it is easy for doctors to order CCP when, in fact, it is not available at most centers. While we have access to FFP, fresh frozen plasma, which is the same product except that it has not had COVID antibodies assayed and it is not indicated for COVID. It is used for coagulation problems generally. While CCP may be easily available at large medical centers such as Johns Hopkins, very few blood banks have this. There really should be a correction to the implication, uh, implication by the good doctor that CCP is easily available. Thanks for your excellent podcast. I found it to be a beacon of light in the confusing COVID fog. You have helped <laughs> guide me in my role as CMO uh, at a very small hospital in, in Vermont. All the best, George. And George is the chief medical officer at uh, Grace Cottage Ho uh, Hospital. All right, so I sent this to Arturo. He said, no, 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 no. You can get it. I will tell you how to get it. He said, he, so he's, I put him in touch with George, and he said, anybody else who wants to know how to get it, the AABB, the uh, Association for the Advancement of Blood and Biotherapies, will help any hospital who doesn't have it to get it. Good. No, don't let that. He said, the problem is that a doctor will ask their blood bank and they say, we don't have it. And then they don't, they don't pursue it. And it ends there. But he said, it shouldn't. You, you can get it. You just have to know where to go. And so he's putting people in touch with him. And uh, anybody else who thinks you can't get it, let me know. I'll send your email to Arturo. He said, send me all the emails. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> all right. Then the last one today is Charles. Nice day in Chapel Hill, <clears throat> about 70 F sunny, and I just got out of a great lecture by Shane Crotty and ran into Ralph Barrick. Ah. Just an excellent way to start a day. You ran into him. Did you get hurt? Did you <laughs> hurt him? I was going to say, I hope well, Ralph is all right. <laughs> this email was prompted by TWIV987 and is a follow-up to a letter of mine that you read on TWIV942. My letter was about the biggest correctable mistakes we made during the COVID 19 pandemic. I said how long it took to get an EUA for remdesivir, and most of the panel talked about testing. <laughs> he doesn't like that we ignored him. Okay. A big part of my bitching was about Watts, worthless, hopeless antiviral trials, <laughs> how Watts kept remdesivir from getting a timely EUA and how that cost lives. After listening to Arturo Casadeval, I would like to revise my opinion and say that Watts were the biggest problem and that remdesivir and convalescent serum were examples of why it was such a problem. Yeah, because it was too late. They treated too late, as uh, the previous oh. writer said. Not only did Watts delay the deployment of effective antiviral treatments, they poisoned the waters for those treatments, making them less likely to be used and muddying the waters so that ineffective treatments look the same in many trials. As for testing, if we do not have rapid testing, no antiviral is going to be effective. We need both good antiviral trials and rapid testing. If the CDC does a not invented here mistake again, all of those in that decision chain need to be gone that very second. It's just a coincidence that I met Dr. Barrick today and I'm writing this letter. The letter was planned two days ago. <laughs> so, uh, Charles, we were just being def deferential in that we wanted to come up with something else. Other than what you had said, you said it was Watts, and we said, "Okay, let's let's try and be unique." So, as you say, you need them both, right? Isn't that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, folks, it's time for some picks. Dixon de Pommier, what are we up to now? <clears throat> well, um, we're up to the drummers. I've got my jazz product project um, front and center here, and uh, the last thing we did was vibraphone. Remember? Mm-hmm. And now we're doing drums and uh, another percussion instrument. Uh, my first choice is Sonny Payne. I, he was Count Basie's uh, drummer and was absolutely responsible for the, the driving force behind such wonderful um, modern progressive jazz. I, I just, uh, I've, I've seen Sonny Payne perform. 
Uh, he's absolutely worth watching. Um, of course, he I'm not sure if he's alive anymore, as a matter of fact, because the Count Basie Orchestra disbanded a little bit after um, Count Basie died. Um, but he was a wonderful drummer, and uh, the reason why that orchestra was so popular was because of the rhythm section, and the, the basis for the rhythm section is drums. Hmm. The best drummer that ever lived, however, by everybody's estimation, was Buddy Rich. And Buddy Rich was a regular guest on the Johnny Carson show, and he used to come on and he used to teach Johnny Carson how to actually play the drums, and he used to sit with him sometimes and, and do that. He also played with Count Basie's orchestra. He was the only white drummer, the only white musician that ever played with Count Basie. He had that distinction, but he was a marvelous, marvelous drummer. Rufus Jones is my third choice, Maynard Ferguson Orchestra, and Joe Morello, uh, for the Dave Brubeck Quartet, was the uh, person behind all of those unusually, um, deliberately unusually, t- uh, time signature pieces that, uh, you know, like Take Five and um, lots of other uh, things that appeared on the, uh, um, the Take Five album. Uh, there wasn't one in a, in a common 3 4 or 4 4 time. Uh, some of them were really quite. Uh, difficult to keep up with just to tap your toes to them but Joe Morello was uh, a consummate drummer and he had a a wonderful sense of classical music as well as uh, jazz so these are my choices for drums Hmm. Buddy Rich huh? the best ever that's what everybody keeps saying Uh, go back to Buddy Rich as the gold standard and then um, there were people that came up almost as good but not quite Buddy Rich was versatile and um, he knew what to do. Let me ask you a, a question, Dixon. Please. Why aren't there any women in any of these picks of yours here? Why, aren't there any good women playing jazz? I never said there weren't. So no. name one. Name a good one. I want to know. A good listen. one? I know. I named one. Diana Crawl. I named her. She's a Oh, I remember her. Singer, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A singer and a pianist. Uh, she's yeah. wonderful. I know her, Ella yeah. Fitzgerald. Come on. They're singers. I, I, I'm not no, necessarily no instrumentalist. instrumentalists. Yeah. Uh, although in there's a Japanese woman, and I'm blocking on her name right now, who runs a group that's, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of women out there that are quite, okay. uh, quite. Wonderful. I just wanted to know. I know the singers for sure, but I just wanted to know if they shied away from the instrumentals for any particular reason. Uh, when I get to my picks for the Dixieland Orchestra, you will see. Okay. That the leader of that is a woman, and uh, she's quite uh, adept at the trumpet. By the way, folks, if you want to hear some good jazz, come to TWIV yeah. 1000. Yeah. The Randy Pommier Quartet will be <laughs> That's entertaining right. you. It sounds nepotistic, but it, it's they not. Have, they have drums, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, so it's I want, an, when we say something funny, I want them to go vroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they can do. <laughs> well, that means they have to listen. I don't know if they're going to be listening. <laughs> oh, they'll listen, all right. But there's a little yeah. alcove for them to sit yeah, on yeah, the no, side. It's fine. perfect. I mean, it's perfect I've, for them. I've requested that they play some Dave Brubeck uh, music, so I think yeah. they will surprise you. I remember that the original idea, so they're going to come back to the incubator and, and play will. for us here. They were going to have a, a female vocalist there, right? I, although we they said were, they, but they, 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 you know, you were right. I think loud. that would be an intrusive yeah. to the, uh, the conversation, kind of yeah. atmosphere that you want to create. I want people the, to talk. Uh, yeah, and if you have right. a lady singing or anyone singing, right, people right. are going to want to listen to them. Right? Exactly right. Exactly no. right. But okay. we, could, we could do something later. I have some ideas about this. Well, this this need not be the... Well, we can come back to the incubator in the future and have a yeah, exactly. uh, a jazz soiree with De Pommier and Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> a little concert. Yeah, no That's problem. That's right. Kathy, have you ever thought about singing uh, jazz um, in a jazz medium? I don't really think I have a solo singing voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, so I am uh, at the end of this episode officially on spring break. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to be doing on spring break is watching this uh, new HBO show that came out um, during this semester that I haven't had time for called The Last of Us. Um, One of the reasons why I will be watching The Last of Us is because everyone is asking me about it, um, as it is about a fungal pandemic. 
Uh Um, that is sort of in this dystopian world um, where this fungus, cordyceps, um, infects humans and turns them into zombies. Um, And all of these terrible things happen. And because everyone is talking to me about the show, um, I have been reading about cordyceps when I have downtime. Um, And uh, so this is one of the many articles that I have read uh, about cordyceps. This is a real fungus, although it uh, does not infect humans, and we do not think that there it's something that could evolve to infect humans. Um, it infects ants, um, and only specific species of ants, uh, and but does in fact turn them into sort of zombies um, who change their behavior for the spread of fungal spores. Uh, but and this is a really nice article talking about um, cordyceps and um, sort of exactly what is uh, the science behind. Um, the Last of Us, why people worry about uh, fungal pandemics and um, the kind of the timeline of what supposedly is happening um, in this pandemic. And since that is a main topic of discussion, it turns out when you teach microbiology, um, if there is a microbiology related show, um, I have suddenly started learning about this new microbe. Cool. Very cool. So uh, this <laughs> fungus <laughs> uh, is really something. Yeah, it really is. They've got a great picture here. I, I, I have an old guy moment here, old, <laughs> old guy vocabulary moment here. They got a picture down towards the bottom of the article with a couple of insects with cordyceps stalks protruding mm-hmm. out of them because these fungi uh, make fruiting bodies out of these insects. So this is like really crazy. And it says, whenever I see an insect with cordyceps stalks pursuing from its exoskeleton, I think, damn, nature is metal. <laughs> okay. So that's a novel use of the word metal to me. This is, is that is, is that is kind of a spinoff from heavy metal? Yeah, it's sort of, you know, hardcore okay. and, and, and cool. Yeah, I kind of like that. Mm-hmm. There's a website <laughs> called Nature is Metal. Is that right? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. I don't. It's a thing. Uh, it's beyond what that guy did. It's 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 a meme or something, huh. you know. Yeah. There there are some other amazing pictures of cordyceps insects in some of the other articles I've looked at. Wow. Nature is. They're beautiful, all very but, metal. <clears throat> there's a Facebook page. Nature is beautiful but scary too. Wow. Cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? First, I have to give you a wintry mix update. The weather app says there's been 1.15 inches in the last hour. Wow. Good. Today's Gracious. total wintry mix will be 16 inches. Oh, no. Mm. Wow. That's uh, a lot. I, I like my old weather app much better. Yeah. <laughs> and better <laughs> forecasts. <laughs> um, so uh, a piece of sad news. In the past, I know I've picked Physics Girl and... I think other people have too. She's done some really nice videos about physics things. The most recent one that I remember picking was about her going on a trip to the Arctic. Turns out she's completely debilitated by long COVID. Uh, She shared this with her Patreon patrons only. Um, Due to her severe ME-CFS symptoms, there are only short moments where she's able to talk. And most of the day, she doesn't have mental or physical capacity to talk, see, or... Oh, so. Or anything, so it's really sad. Ugh. Our oh, best to I'm, physics girl. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, probably everybody knows somebody who's got some form of long COVID, and uh-huh. and other things happen to people. But she just seemed so full of life and was really good at science communication, and uh, just not fair. Uh. Uh, anyway, my pick is a, a podcast called "That's What They Say." that's actually derived from our local NPR radio station (laughs) between uh, the announcer and an English professor here, uh, Anne Curzan, who recently became the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and we were all worried that she would stop doing these little radio bits, but um, she hasn't. And they're five minutes long, and they're about various topics. And this one that I have picked 
is about the pronunciation of primer or primer. <laughs> and it was, I, I ran into her at a meeting in the fall and I said, I think I'm going to send you this. And, and I gave her some background, both when I talked to her and when I uh, sent it in. And so she includes that in this. So she references TWIV, although she doesn't call it that. She just said a podcast and talks about the recent time when I think it was Vincent who said, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And I volunteered that I do know. And so it goes on from there. So uh, you might like to hear this particular one. It's kind of meta. And then uh, there's lots of other short ones with uh, interesting topics that they do. So remind me, what's the bottom line on the pronunciation of this? So if you're talking about uh, a Dick Jane and Sally book or a basic manual of how to do something, it's a primer. Okay. And it's derived from one word, uh, a Latin form. And then if you're talking about how to uh, uh, prime for paint, for DNA synthesis with a primer, <laughs> uh, she also talked about a couple other instances of it. Then it's primer, and that's derived from another word that uh, you just have to listen to that. Episode. Back in the old days when engines had uh, carburetors, <laughs> yes, you could uh, yes. start them up with a primer, yeah. Okay, right. and she also talks about um, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, and how whenever he says the word, he'll say "primer, primer" or "primer, primer." <laughs> so yeah. he he knows that people are confused. In the old days, we used to put ether in the carburetor. Yeah. Rich. Yeah, there were, you'd get spray cans of ether. Yeah, which you can't oh. get anymore, right? Right. Well, who cares? Yeah, you can't. You can't get the spray cans of ether, and you don't have carburetors anyway, so. <laughs> That's right. Well, one other thing is that in England, um, back, it sounds like it was in the, I think it's in the late 1800s, they switched to pronouncing it primer no matter which way it was, uh -huh. whereas we oh. have hung, hung on to the older hmm. primer pronunciation. Cool. Interesting. Rich, what do you have for us? I strongly suspect that I have picked these before, but I don't care. I'm going to pick them again. Uh, <laughs> two, uh, two YouTube videos uh, that come under the general heading of slow motion art uh, that are very slow motion, uh, an uh, not animations, videos of uh, mostly people uh, dropping things of various shapes into liquids uh, and right. see what happens. Or, or like... Uh, piercing a balloon full of milk uh, above a rotating <laughs> yeah, yeah, colander. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good stuff, see, good stuff. see what happens. And um, so I'll just put these two here for you to amuse yourself. And if you do that, of course, YouTube will help you fall down the rabbit hole of slow motion <laughs> photography, and you can go on for the rest of the day. Rich, have you ever seen ultra slow motion lightning? Ooh. It is Amazing. I'll Absolutely that. That sounds amazing. Good. I like that. Uh, my pick is uh, an app called Grammarly. It's a good one. It is Suggested a good one. to me by a student who uh, told me they use it at their school. The professors use it to check their essays. And um, <laughs> I, it, one, of the, one of the features is you could, it'll check for plagiarism. That's true. So uh, you can it'll run a, your essay against the database, and it, it does a good job of picking up stuff. Uh, you know, if students lift sentences even from uh, online sources without changing them at all. But it also will monitor, you know, routine grammar issues that you might not be aware of, and you can you can install it on your computer, and it it can be active in different apps. It could be active in Word. It could be active in a in a web browser right. or not. You can control where it's active. Right. And um, I just <clears throat> we just wrote a an NIH grant. I was just looking at an NIH grant, and I had it running. And it picks up a lot of little things that you would miss. It's kind of handy for that, and yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. some suggestions. You know, you don't need to use all of it. Because sometimes it gets dry, but you can pick different that. styles too. It's kind of interesting. So this you, you can get have rewarded this... for doing the right thing, though, don't you? It's just <laughs> wow, way to go! <laughs> so uh, I you love can, that you can have this running that. in the background as you're typing yeah. something. So it yeah. backseat yeah. drives my. Uh, yeah, my writing. Yeah, it, gives, it puts a little icon uh, in, the, in the corner of the document, and then you click it. It will actually also underline words and tell if you if you right click or something, it'll tell you what you should be doing. You know, uh, yeah. so you, can, you can do that. It also has a a way where you can actually just 
take a finished document and drag and the document it. into it that's and right. it runs it that's through. Right. That's exactly how right. I usually exactly. use it and yeah, how I recommend You could do it both ways. It. I kind of yeah, like yeah. seeing it running as I'm as I'm writing. It's interesting. What's, what's their business model? How It's free. So how does that work? Well, there's a paid version. Uh, that you can use it as a professional more version. That's right. Yeah, That's right. I mean, I, I bought, one. I bought the I one, the one. If you want uh, plagiarism checking, yeah, I think you have to buy it. But uh, I just want to support them because I think it's pretty cool. And one of the I things agree. they do is they suggest rephrasings, right? If you have a little bit yes, of yes, that's right, that's right. Of awkward. Uh, anyway, it's really nice. You can just try the free version and uh, see if it's for your needs. But it's very um, helpful. Very I helpful. like it very much. And I normally wouldn't have used something like this, but um, I, it's quite interesting. <laughs> mm. We have a listener pick from Charles who links to a NPR story, uh, which is psychologist Daniel Levitin dis dissects Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Yes. And Charles writes, I was 15. The album was the most popular album among my friends. I still listen to it from time to time. I still wonder at times if I missed the starting gun. I sent this story to several people as well. It, it's it's an amazing story, so I highly recommend it. I will it. have to listen to this. Yes. Yeah. Tell me the lead, lead singer's name again. Pink Floyd? Yeah. I don't know. Because he's got an interesting politics. Really? Yeah. What, what kind of... Look into that. Not... not, not the kind that you'd expect from someone. In Roger Waters? Like that. That's the one. He's had some really uh, negative press recently. Yeah. Okay. I I like uh, Pink Floyd. I think they're I do, nice. too. No, I, I think it's... Yeah, this, and this came out because it's the 50th anniversary of the Dark Side of the Moon. Hmm. So when we have the 50th anniversary of TWIV, we have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> The dark Actually, side not, of virology. I'm not sure. <laughs> how, many, how many years have we been running? 2008, Two eight. right? <clears throat> yep. Yes, it's going to be, I'm not going to make 50 years. We're going to have to do 20 yeah. or something like that. We'll have a 25-year anniversary. That's right. <laughs> we'll do another, uh, we don't need to have another theater one, but we can do a, a party at the <laughs> incubator with a, with a jazz band and a singer. How's that, Dixon? That sounds great. All right, that's TWIV. 989. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. You can send questions and comments and pics to twiv at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, we'd really like to have your financial support because we don't do ads or anything like that. We don't monetize. We want you to have uninterrupted learning. And we think our model is that you'll be happy to pay for it. So you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute and i'm sorry to say that you know the amazon smile program is order we got over we got our last check for 450 bucks yesterday so not bad thank you everyone for shopping with us as your charity dixon de pommier trichinella.org livingriver.org thank you dixon very informative uh twiv very informative <laughs> Kathy Spindler's at the I University. Didn't have much to say, but it was a good swim. <laughs> Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Brianne Barker, Drew University, Bioprof Barker on the Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I learned a lot. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. You'd never know it by his his contribution, so he doesn't sound retired. I think you're faking us all out here, Rich. You're still active. Uh, I'm going to drop off the edge of the flat earth any minute. Yeah, <laughs> flat earth. <laughs> Vincent Racaniello, you can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.